Hi, and welcome to First Draft for October. Um, I'm Mary Chris Escobar. I'm here with my lovely co-host, um, Julia Kelly and Alexis Ann. And today on the show, we are going to be tackling the subject of info dumps, and we'll talk about what that is and how to avoid it. But before we get into that, I will go around the virtual room here and uh, let you all introduce yourselves. So we'll start um, on my left with Alexis. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexis Ann. I write contemporary and erotic romance. And today, because of health reasons, I'm drinking water. Um, you can find me at alexisannbooks.com. And Julia? yeah, I'm Julia Kelly. Sorry, I never know when to just jump in or wait. <laughs> uh, I'm Julia Kelly. I'm a historical and contemporary romance author. Um, today, I am drinking out of my lovely first draft mug uh, hot chocolate because I was actually um, just writing up a blog post about Cinderella adaptations. So I was going back to my childhood of watching Cinderella over and over and over and over again, and I felt a little, little some nostalgic, especially as it's getting a little cooler here in New York City and we're actually starting to feel like fall. So hot chocolate sounded like the perfect, perfect drink. Excellent. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm Mary Chris Escobar and I write uh, women's fiction and I'm at marychrisescobar.com. I am also drinking water and excitedly my first draft mug was actually clean. And Yay. so I remembered uh, to use it, but I ran eight miles this morning. So water seems like the best choice. Um, however, if you um, are feeling great and did not run eight miles and aren't feeling nostalgic and wanting hot chocolate and are looking for something to drink along with us, uh, this is the perfect season for Oktoberfest. So the Oktoberfest celebration, I believe, runs technically through October 3rd, but as we were talking before the show, you can still get Oktoberfests almost anywhere uh, in stores or in bars. So a nice um, just kind of well, the, the probably most authentic one would be a Spaten Oktoberfest, which is a German import. Um, but you could also go with uh, like a Sam Adams Oktoberfest is a great choice that you should be able to find most places. So uh, now's a great time to enjoy that delicious multi Marzen style Oktoberfest. Um, cool. So as I mentioned, uh, today we are going to tackle the subject of info dumps. Uh, and we realized uh, this is more of a craft topic, and we hadn't talked about craft in a while. We've been talking a lot about the business side of writing, uh, about the publishing industry and journeys to publication, but we hadn't really focused on craft. And we actually got a really, really lovely email from one of uh, someone listening to our podcast, Ellen. So hi, Ellen, if you're listening. Uh, and she had some great questions about something we brought up related to craft. And so it reminded us how much we like talking about that, and we thought we would tackle a craft topic for October. So um, what we want to talk a little bit about is um, what and what we mean when we say info dump and then some techniques for sort of, well, also why you don't want to do that and then how you can avoid it. So how you can give some background information without dumping it. So can I ask if one of you wants to describe what we mean when we say info dump? Sure. Uh, it's telling me absolutely everything I ever needed to know about everything to do with this story in one moment. And so basically it is uh, a typically a very, very long description of either all of a character's backstory or all of a world's uh, history or the way that an entire government works if you're kind of doing some world building. Um, so what it does is you kind of, you get a few lines into it and then the reader starts to just lose interest. And um, it becomes this very heavy amount of information that's almost like reading a homework assignment. So mm -hmm. what we don't want to do is, um, you know, make readers you know, their eyes glaze over and suddenly you have this moment of being like, okay, I'm, I just, I need to put this book down. Um, so generally I, it's a big no and it's a big please avoid doing if at all possible. So. Definitely. Anything to add to that, Lexi? Uh, it definitely reads a lot like picking up a scientific journal or a research article because you're just getting data. Um, and a lot of the time it happens at the beginning of a story when you don't really know who these people are, where you're at, you have no context. And so you're getting inundated with information that you can't categorize or put anywhere in your head. It's a little bit different if you get a little bit of an info dump halfway or three quarters away through a story, like all of a sudden you get to the big backstory that you've been waiting for this whole time. And you know who that bad guy is and who that good girl is and what world they're on and why that dress mattered um, because you can put it in context. Um, 
But other than that, it's just data and you don't know what to do with it. And it's heavy and it's like reading a research paper. And you really, really, really want to avoid that because if you're writing fiction, you're doing it to entertain your reader and keep them turning the pages. And they're not going to do that if they're like, I don't know who Lard Mark 7 is of the planet Alderaan <laughs> and why her shirt is red. I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So I, I, one of my questions or one of my thoughts is going to be, where does where do we feel like this usually happens? And I, I was thinking before the show that I do feel like it often tends to happen in the beginning. Um, you know, this feeling that I need to let the reader know who all the characters are and what their their entire backstory is, or especially if you're writing, you know, historical or, you know, something that's set in a world that is not the world we're in now. I must tell them everything about this you know, dystopian universe I've created like right now. Um, so I do think it tends to happen in the beginning, which of course is the last place you want to bog down your reader like, at the very beginning of the story. Well, what yeah, doing, you know, I, oh no, go ahead. <laughs> what you're doing a lot of the time is you're telling instead of mm -hmm. showing. And that's, it's a big bog down on the reader. You don't want to do them a lot of telling. You want to show them things. And one of the great things about fiction is giving them the little breadcrumbs along the way. So if you give them everything all at once, you have nothing left to give them for the rest of the story. So that don't try and do everything right in the beginning. Let them discover and let the story unfold page by page. Yeah, I was, I've been watching a lot of police procedural TV shows recently, and I have noticed that one of the things that drives me crazy, and I love at the same time because I love the genre, is there is always a younger assistant who always needs to be filled in about something. Mm. And so somebody will walk up on the scene and be like, what happened here? And the younger assistant will be like, well, so-and-so and so-and-so, and, so and, so, and as you know, and it's basically this moment of being like, as you know, when somebody dies, such and such happens, and it means this, this, and this. And it's like, well, yes, if the character knew that, why are we reiterating that? We're talking about it so that the viewer is immediately caught up because we don't have that much time in television. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a great. I think it's a big crutch that a lot of um, that a lot of shows use. Um, I think it's even more blatant when it's in uh, books because you have so much more uh, expansive ways to go through and look at. This is how we're going to, you know, like you said, put these little bread crumbs in and lead the reader along. You you have to trust your re that your reader is intelligent enough to figure this stuff out. And I think sometimes it can be a fine line. You obviously don't want to make it so vague um, and so difficult for the reader to figure out that by the end of the book they're like I don't know what just <laughs> happened and why it matters but I think that you can trust your reader a little bit more than the young police detective being like <laughs> as you know um throughout parts of of tv shows so um yeah now that you now I've mentioned it you will see it over and over mm -hmm. and over and over again and I apologize because <laughs> it's gonna drive you crazy <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And, you know, I, as you mentioned that, and you mentioned that in the relation to a television series, I wonder too, if, if you're writing in a series, if there isn't the temptation to do that, like the, let's catch you up mm -hmm. on what happened last week, like what happened in the last hard. book and how, how do you avoid <laughs> doing it's that? Hard. It's really I, hard. I had to do that with um, the governess series. And for me, I wanted to limit it to no more than one paragraph of being like, this is where these characters are. And then little mentions throughout the text of this is where this, you know, this person's married, this person's pregnant, this person's living here, this person's doing this thing. I don't want it to be, you know, let's just take away from our story and step back for a moment. And let me give you half a chapter on the status of the people that you checked in with last time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Definitely. I, I always go, what do they need to know right now? If they haven't heard from this character in 300 pages, then yeah, throw in Logan's little sister. That's information they need to know to put the character back in context. But they don't need Logan's little sister who went back to college and studied medicine and had to take a year off when she got pneumonia and then and then and then. <laughs> they don't need all that. Um, especially, I mean, to a certain extent, every writer has a different style with how much they like to reiterate information. Um, but there's also that you, you leave the breadcrumb, you remind the person who it is, or if they haven't read that part of the series yet, it gives them a reason to go back and read that part of the series. So please don't over explain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause I think like the over explaining is a disservice to the person who has been reading yes. since the beginning, but I could see the value of all readers. Like let's say maybe you read the first book and there's been a gap, you know, getting to the second book, all readers could use the reminder. This is, whatever you just said, Logan's little sister, like, 
oh, right, like that's who this is. And then the person who's picking the series up somehow in book two has context, just like you said, that might then make them curious to go back. Mm -hmm. So really, the I love the term of like leaving the breadcrumbs, but that's how you hook the reader. I mean, you give them enough so that they're like, but what did happen in the past? Like, who is that person? And that will either, it will hopefully do two things. It will pull them through the current story. But if it is part of a series or a serial, it may also make them want to go back because they're never going to get all of it in that one book. They're just going to get this little, like, this is how this person, like, I think a great way to put it is what, what's necessary to the story. Like, what do yes. you have to say so that the rest of the story makes sense? And it, it isn't bad to remind readers of who a character is and what their relationship. I sometimes forget that within the same book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, too, especially yeah. if you put it down for a couple of days. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll come back and I'll be like, the name sounds familiar, uh -huh. but I couldn't tell you who this person was. Yes, I'm doing that. I'm really slowly because I, I tend to read a book a month for my books and brews that I do on my blog. And, and I have this other book that I'm really enjoying that I'm reading really slowly as I finish that. And it's, and it's, no, no fault of the author or anything. It's just that I'm reading it slowly and I pick it up and I'm like, no, who are these people <laughs> again? Like, I really need to keep character notes, like, so that I don't have to keep going back to remind myself who they are. When, um, with a uh, mystery series, because I love mystery and action series as my go-to late night reads. Um, I, I love that you can pick those series up anywhere. Book 12, book five, there's a an overarching backstory that's always going on in the background. The the hero and the badass spy lady, they get together, they get married, they get divorced, they have a kid, they have a dog, who knows what's going on in the background. And it doesn't matter. You can pick up any book in the series and you know that you're going to get just enough information to be able to get through the book that you're reading um, without getting that info dump. So I, I always think about those series because I think they do them so well um, and just take that information into writing romance. Um, and try and incorporate the same technique. Mm -hmm. So how do you, so, so we've kind of addressed this <laughs> idea that you don't want to just put all the backstory, all the character relationships, all the world building on your first paragraph, like in your first chapter. But you as a writer, if you're starting a brand new series or starting a brand new book, you, you need to do that. Like you need to know who these people are and where they live and what the world looks like. So do you all have a technique that you use for doing that so that you don't just dump it on the page? I feel like the technique is giving me way more credit than I, <laughs> than I do. Um, yeah, sort of. So um, I... Lexi, a strategy? Is that maybe. Because the they're pretty partnered for me, so they know that this is not always as, as foolproof. My strategy is usually I have too little backstory when I initially write a first draft. Mm -hmm. So what I end up doing is I've started creating these very, very basic character sketches where, you know, I have eye color, which I'm notorious for messing up, and, you know, who their, what their age is, what their age is relative to siblings, all that stuff. But the other thing that I want to make sure is on there is, is the backstory, because that's the justification in romance, right? That's the reason that they don't believe they can be loved. That's the reason they don't believe they can be in a relationship with somebody. It's where all the inter internal conflict springs from. So yeah, I try to make sure I have, yeah, <laughs> I try to make sure I have an idea of what that stuff is beforehand. And then typically I'll write a very fast draft or I'll attempt to write a very fast draft. And then I'll have to go back and weave some of that stuff in. So I'm, when I'm going through and doing kind of the back end of a first draft, um, I'm going in and I'm, I'm trying to figure out where are these little emotional places where I can put context um, and the context being, why is this person feeling like they're held back? Why is this person feeling like they're, they're unloved or they can't trust or whatever that thing is? And I think that in romance, especially romance authors are very good at, at using it as fuel for the emotion and finding the emotion in the backstory. And so that's why if you just dump all your info in one place, you lose all the emotional tension, you you lose all the emotional justification for the story. So I think really that's when you get into the period of time where you you start seeing little bits of information in conversation. You see a little bit of bits of information in sex scenes are great for that because that's when you're very raw and very emotional. And I know you're going to talk about this, so I'm really <laughs> excited to hear what you say. Um, so 
stole your thunder. Uh, but no, it, <laughs> it's that little quiet moment when the character is thinking about themselves and where they are in their lives and why they can or cannot be with the person that they can or cannot be with. Um, I think those are ripe for, uh, ripe for backstory. And so I try to make sure that everything is leading back to that emotional conflict and that internal conflict about why can I not be with that person. So it really helps me to write it down beforehand and to try to be very careful about how much I do it. Because you can also sit there and be like, I know that you lost your mother at a young age and you can't trust or love anymore. You've told me that 14 <laughs> times. I'd never want to hear you say it again. So it's fine balance. Um, but I think that that's one way that, that can be really helpful is just establishing. And then when you're going through an editing being like, what do I need to do to make this feel more emotionally connected? Awesome. All right, Lexi, take yes. it away with your example. <laughs> well, now I have three things I have to say. Dang it. <laughs> that's awesome. How many were there beforehand? Was two. It two or four? Oh, okay. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about the way that I, I info dump in sex scenes because that is like the Alexis Ann technique. How do I weave in the information in a sex yeah. scene? Well, you yeah. non-info dump, you weave, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. Which is like, I guess we'll start there. Um, so sex scenes can be overwhelming and they can be very info information heavy, even if you're just describing hand here, body part here. And <laughs> we need Alexandra's drawing. <laughs> You're right. It's like you guys are doing like the Macarena. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm voguing or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it can get very technical and very information he heavy. And so one of the great things that you can do with a sex scene is interweave the emotional layers, which a lot of it comes from the backstory. Why is it that I have hated you all this time? Why is it I have refused to kiss you up until this point and so you have a little bit of action you know the kissing the hugging the scent the whatever it is that point you're at in the scene and then you get some internal monologue of why have I resisted this for so long it's because my father was a horrible person and that one time when I was a child and then you have some more action you know the shirt comes off the bra comes off <laughs> oh my gosh he's so sexy and then he says something. But I can't something. have him because right <laughs> And then he says something and that triggers maybe a point of dialogue for two or three paragraphs where she suddenly says this and then he says that. And then so you go from action to dialogue to internal monologue and you get to weave those three things mm -hmm. in and out throughout the scene. And it's a great place to have uh, an emotional release, to release backstory, to bring things together and then tear them back apart again, which is why I love writing sex scenes. <laughs> and why they're so satisfying when they're done well because you feel like you really learn something about the characters. Exactly. Um, yes, and they advance the plot. They're not yes. just. Yes, we're they're gonna do not a just whole podcast on advancing the plot through sex scenes. Yes, we, they're not the just. Hill we will die on. <laughs> oh, like time for a sex scene. Let me put it in. Like it's like there is actually some movement, some character development, some some backstory weaving, like there's a, a purpose. <laughs> exactly. The very best yeah. sex scenes have that yes. purpose that advance the plot. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Point number two. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like to think of backstory the same way that I think it's, it's Stephen King. I don't know whose, whose technique it is that you don't start the story until the last possible second. When, if you had started the plot any later, the reader would not know what was going on. You know, I think it's Stephen King's technique. I don't know. It anyway. Sounds familiar. So probably. <laughs> so yeah. it's basically, you have this whole story in your head. All these things have happened. You don't start it until the last possible second into the action, whether it's in the middle of a battle, in the middle of a horrible scene, in the middle of a discovery, whatever it is. If you start it any later than that in your head, in that timeline, the reader has absolutely no idea what's going on. Who are these characters? Why are we here? The story makes no sense. So you keep backing it up until you reach that point where you have that blend of action and the reader is grounded in what's happening in this universe. I use the same thing for backstory. Does, does the reader absolutely need to know this right now in order to understand what is happening in this scene? Do they need to know that Logan left home at 16 or do they just need to know that he's unhappy okay we just need to know he's unhappy we can find a spot in four chapters to explain that he left home at 16. Um, and so just what is most necessary is what i focus on in any given scene third point <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> what 
three. For instance, <laughs> I've done this several times in my books, including the one that I just published recently, where I have a, sh- I was going to swear, a lot of backstory that doesn't make sense. And I, and I struggled with writing both of these books because there was so much backstory and I'm trying to fill in who she is, who he is, why they hate each other, why this is all happening. And it just reads as this giant info dump and it drives me crazy because I can't stand it because I want to start in the action. What I did in both these books is I do a jump scene. So I start three quarters of the way through the book. Um, in, in one of the highest tension moments in the story, you're just dropped right into the middle of this emotional scene. The very first scene in the storm inside is Jake and Eve doing it in a cabin, hating each other and loving each other. And then we cut back several months to when they first see each other. I did it in Five Dirty Sins. I could not figure out how to tell these two's backstory because she has three identities. He has two. You guys have no idea what's going on and why they have all these different identities. So I started the action at the end of the book when both their lives are in danger. And then I cut back six months and started introducing the characters and when they first met and who they are. And then you, you know that they have different names. You know that their lives are in danger. You just don't know why. But you spend the next 12 chapters figuring that out. And that's my favorite technique. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. and that's the great thing about like the breadcrumb idea is you want to keep reading because you know what you need to know, which is that their lives are in danger. But you want to keep reading to find out why yeah. they are. And I think there's something, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, like back to the storm inside, like even in that first chapter, it starts with action. But like she has some internal dialogue that's like, oh, I'm not sure I should be doing this. <laughs> so you as the reader already know like there's something in the past. Like, yes. So there's that hint, that breadcrumb is kind of what we're talking about. Why is this a bad choice? Why are they in this situation? You don't ever get that information fully in that first scene. Just enough to know that there is a backstory, there is a reason, there is a justification. And yay, I get to spend the rest of the book figuring this out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know who's really good at this, actually, now that I think about it? I just finished the fourth book in her series. Uh, Sarah McLean does this a lot in the uh, Rule of Scoundrels, I want to say, series. This is the one about the gaming hell. Mm -hmm. And each of the characters has a very deep backstory that goes and justifies every single thing they do, not only in their own books, but throughout the whole series. So when you get to the fourth book, which is called um, Never Judge a Lady by Her Cover, I... the, that character is so, so steeped in backstory because you've had four books to um, – something is rumbling in the background. I don't know whose computer it is. Um, it was a car outside. Sorry. Oh, it was a car. Okay, that was loud. Yeah. Um, My door is open. Sorry. Uh, so, um, I wanted to make sure nobody was – nobody's home was, you know – crashing down around them. Uh, So you're so deep into, uh, you know something's going on with this character, but you don't know what, that as you go through that book, it's little tiny reveal after little tiny reveal after little tiny reveal. And it's so satisfying when you finally get a full picture of this person, because of course it also comes at a highly emotional moment. Of course it, you know, it's a big, big point throughout the book that suddenly, you know, it's worth it to have had that backstory withheld and to just be fed tiny little intriguing bits throughout the entire thing. Um, so I think, you know, there are some authors do this really, really well. That's, I thought one particularly good example. Um, and if you do read that, read them in order, trust me. (laughs) So it was, it's really interesting. This rarely happens, but I am actually reading that series right now. And like the sec, but I'm not reading them in order because I couldn't find the first one at the bookstore, which long story, but anyway, there is a one page or like one and a half page prologue that doesn't make any sense to me, probably because it's tied to the other books. And I know it's it's going to tie back in, I'm sure, to this book, but it's keeping me reading because I'm like, now what does that have to do with anything I'm reading? And and I have to finish because I have to know who those characters are in the prologue and what it has to do with anything else. And I'm I don't sure if I had started the prologue, but we will have to talk about it afterwards because I'm really curious if it's yes. Worth- yeah. yeah, so I'm totally confused. But I also knew I was picking up with the second book. Um, and it, Sarah McLean is coming to our local conference, which I'm super excited about. So I'm just trying to read something <laughs> before she gets here. Um, well, and when you think about it, it's like real life. When you meet someone, they don't say, hi, I was born in Calgary on a, on a cold winter's night to a mother who did this and a father who did that. And then I went to this element. Nobody does that. You say, 
hi, I'm Alexis, I write romance novels. And maybe over the course of the night, you learn a little bit more about that person. And the more you spend time with them, you, you learn, oh, you grew up here, you have these problems, you have these health concerns. Oh, and th this... <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm so right. <laughs> This is a this is a podcast that's getting many guest uh, appearances by random cards. So, so at any time, I think that you, you have a question as to whether this is something that needs to be included in your story at this point. Think if you had just met this person, would you know this about this person yet? And at least gives you some sort of guideline to maybe say yes or no to. Yeah, and that's a perfect example because never would you meet someone and tell them your entire <laughs> life story in the first five minutes that you knew them. Have. You, you couldn't. couldn't do it. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, well, we are coming up. We have about five minutes yeah. left. So I feel like we, um, we've really covered a lot. I mean, there's, there's so much we could go into here. Um, but I think the big takeaways are you, you need to know the backstory as the author. So however you do that, um, whether you do like a kind of series Bible or character sketches, or to be honest, I sometimes write it and then just cut it out <laughs> like, and or cut it and put it in a file. Like if, if you need to get it out to understand the history as the writer, do that. It just maybe then doesn't have, or it definitely doesn't have a place in your final draft. Um, this is also why critique partners, uh, editors, you know, whoever is so important because you also will sometimes leave some of that in and not even realize that you have left it there. Um, because oh, either yeah. you, you sketched it in as part of, your process, or it didn't seem info dumpy to you, but, but if someone else reads it. So that's, again, just why that fresh set of eyes is so important on your work, because uh, you won't always catch this in your own work. I'll, I'll give you guys a really quick example. I have a book coming out next fall, and it's a, it was sold as a completed manuscript, but it was sold as a completed manuscript of 100,000 words, and the publisher would like it to be 80 to 85,000 words, which is a lot less words if you think about it. So I've been reading it, and I've been taking notes on what I can cut, and there is a section in the beginning that I thought was so vital. It's been since the very first draft, that I, and I've rewritten this book multiple times. It's been in, and I just read it having not read this book in about a year, and I just basically took my pen and went straight through all of it because it is not necessary. Because oh, that, Yeah, that element yeah. of the book gets told throughout the rest of the book without it having to be there, and there is nothing a value that I gain by having that in and I lose 800 words, you know, it, and that's really important when you're trying to chop down a manuscript <laughs> by that much. So, um, yeah, it's, it's doable. If you can, if you can give it some time and then step away and come back and see, does any of this feel unnecessary baggy? Um, am I, am I not adding value? Then I think that's the first thing that you cut out in terms of info dumps. It's hard, Definitely. but could you, critique partners also really help mm -hmm. but but time is a good point as well like I think sometimes when you're super close to it you're mm -hmm. not going to see it but if you give it a little bit of time it's going to be easier to catch that and again you may want to copy that and put it I mean because you don't want to forget what that backstory is it just yeah that's a whole book even... section that you get to give readers when the book exactly comes out. exactly <laughs> could be like yeah those are great like right those are right for like the character's journal or something like like all that backstory all that thought can mm -hmm. be like the journal of that character or something like that bonus material man yeah um any final thoughts that either of you have about avoiding backstory leaving um again i love i also love the cookie crumb analogy or the, the crumb trail because they're tiny right like if you think about like we're not dropping entire cookies <laughs> like it's just right. it's we don't want crumbs. rats <laughs> right exactly it's just a few ants now <laughs> but um this analogy got out of hand <laughs> it got really out of hand but you want them to be really small so you're just I mean you're really just talking about just little little crumbs as you go yes. through yep absolutely totally agree Ooh. well if we want to go around one last time um, and just promote anything that you have going on, um, I'll start again with Alexis. Hi, I'm Alexis Ann. You can find me at alexisannbooks.com. Um, I have the sixth book in my T series coming out in November. It's up for pre order at all the retailers right now. And uh, Tease is free on all the retailers until it stops being awesome to be free. <laughs> <laughs> I like that as a timeline. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm Julia Kelly, and uh, my book, The Governess Was Wicked, is out now. Um, it is two ninety nine at all ebook retailers, and uh, it is soon to be followed by The Governess Was Wanton, which comes out October 10th, um, and then The Governess Was Wild comes out in November. So you're going to be hearing about governess books for the next couple of months <laughs> on first draft. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's up right now. That's very exciting. And I've got a whole bunch of blog posts and supplemental stuff um, that uh, I've been writing. So if you guys are interested, uh, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, juliakellywrites.com. Cool. And I'm Mary Chris Escobar, and you can find me at marychrisescobar.com. Um, also, if you sign up for my newsletter, I have a free uh, novella that you get, and I also give away uh, a book every month in my Books and Brews series to newsletter subscribers only. Um, also, I'll just do a quick little plug. My local writing group is doing their writing conference in two weeks on the 15th and 16th. And as I mentioned, Sarah McLean it will be there um, along with other fabulous writers. And I'll be moderating a couple panels. So if you happen to live in or around the Richmond, Virginia area and are interested in that, uh, you would just go to Google jamesriverwriters.com and check out our conference. Um, that is it for us today. So thank you all so much for watching or listening. Uh, we really appreciate feedback from um, listeners and we wouldn't, we're doing this for you. So uh, we appreciate knowing what you're interested in hearing more about. And if you have a minute to leave us a thumbs up on YouTube or a review on iTunes, we would love that. It just helps other interested writers find our information. So thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you in November. Bye. Bye. Bye.